the danger may be escalating. It's an atomic fire and the Soviets can't contain it. Thousands may already have died or been seriously contaminated. Good evening, I'm Ted Koppel and this is Nightline. The Soviet reactor is still burning. The weather is shifting and both those factors could be critical in determining the scope of this nuclear disaster. We'll go live to Warsaw for the latest on the impact behind the Iron Curtain, to Paris to talk with an expert on European reactor design, to Washington for a U.S. Senator's reaction after a top-level briefing today, and we'll talk with a Soviet expert about what the Russians may be hiding and why. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. When a similar accident happened in Great Britain, and you'll be hearing more about that in a few minutes, British authorities suppressed the details for more than 25 years. It is hardly surprising, then, that the Soviet Union, which has an infinitely more secretive tradition, is revealing only the sparsest information about its own nuclear disaster. But disaster is how even the Soviets are describing it. But where they concede two dead, diplomatic and other sources claim that more than 2,000 may already have died. Where the Soviets claim that the radiation situation is stable, U.S. intelligence sources insist that the graphite core of the reactor is still burning and spewing radiation into the atmosphere. The traveling White House press corps with President Reagan in Bali has just moments ago been briefed on what the U.S. government has been able to learn. Joining us now live by phone from Bali, ABC's senior White House correspondent Sam Donaldson. Sam, since I don't know what... You have just been told. Why don't you bring us up to date? Give us the headline. Well, Ted, the press secretary, Larry Speaks, said a few minutes ago that based on the data that the United States is collecting, the fire in the fourth graphite reactor is, in fact, still burning. The fire has destroyed the reactor, which began with 200 tons of uranium interspersed with 1,700 tons of graphite. And Speaks says that as long as the fire burns, radiation will continue to be expelled from that fire because no one in the world has experience in dealing with this kind of fire. Now, there is a cloud of radioactive material moving across the Soviet Union. Speak says it is too early to determine whether it will reach the United States, but he says, even if it does, it is highly unlikely, and I want to stress that's his language, highly unlikely that there would be a level of radiation that reached the United States that would be dangerous to public health. Now, as to the Americans that may be in the area of Kiev, uh, Ted, Speak says the U.S. has no accurate count since Americans traveling in the Soviet Union don't have to inform the embassy of their whereabouts, but there is a group of American students in the Kiev area, we believe. We have no information on them, and the Soviets have not told us anything that would suggest that uh, any Americans had been involved in, the, in a casualty list. As far as help for the Soviet Union, uh, uh, Assistant Secretary of State Ridgway expressed to the Soviet Chargé in Washington uh, a few hours ago that the United States stood ready to help, and we uh, very much regret what's happened. But so far, the Soviets have apparently not asked us for a great deal of help. All right, Sam, let me, <clears throat> let me just throw one quick question at you, and I don't know if you have the answer to this. As you heard in, in the introduction to this program, we are somewhere between two and two thousand in terms of fatalities here. The Soviets are acknowledging that two people have died. Diplomatic sources are saying it could be as many as two thousand. Uh, did Larry Speaks have anything to say on that subject? He was certainly asked and said he had nothing to report on casualties. He had no f casualty figures. As you know, Ted, they're very uh, shy about revealing anything that would suggest that the United States through our national technical means or any other method uh, has information that is not public. But Speaks did flatly deny that we knew about this accident before the Soviets made it public. There is a report, as you know, that we learned about it perhaps late Friday or early Saturday through our own spy satellite or some other intelligence means, but Speaks says that's not true. All right, Sam Donaldson, thank you very much for that late update. We, of course, know little of what Soviet authorities are doing for their own people in the immediate vicinity of the accident, but in neighboring Poland, authorities have taken immediate and decisive action. Standing by live in Warsaw is ABC correspondent David Ensor. David, what's happening in Poland? Uh, Ted, uh, the, uh, the government has uh, banned the sale of milk, restricted it, and a special government commission has been set up uh, which has uh, 
uh, arranged uh, emergency measures, uh, emergency plans that are being drawn up just in case, as well as measures to uh, control contaminated food, which they think there may be. Um, it, in about two hours' time, all the young school children of uh, northeast Poland are going to be given a one-time dose of iodine as a preventative measure against uh, the effects of radioactivity. Now, this may sound like a this may sound like a strange. Poles avoid milk. David, this may sound like a strange question because obviously we are accustomed to hearing things in some kind of a context. But are the Polish people being told what has happened in the Soviet Union, and are they being given any information whatsoever? of what the dangers to them may be. They are being told that, it, that there has been a disaster, a nuclear disaster in the Soviet Union. And it is being stressed to them that although a radioactive cloud has passed over Poland, there is no real danger to human life. That's the phrase that, that the announcers and the government officials keep using, no real danger to human life. Uh, the danger to human health, however, uh, may, be, may be considerable near the border. Uh, it's not clear. The Polish Institute of Physics is saying that the radioactivity levels are 20 times the normal level in Bialystok near the border. They are six times the normal level here in Warsaw. All right. Are they being told what's happening in the Soviet Union, or is that, is that wonderful custom behind the, uh, behind the Iron Curtain of getting information by word of mouth? Is that providing any information? Uh, the, uh, the, the television and radio are saying that there's been this disaster at a, at a Soviet nuclear plant. Uh, they only uh, set, started saying that uh, uh, earlier, to, to earlier today. Um, yesterday they were saying there might have been an accident in Sweden. But now they're saying it's a Soviet accident. Um, as far as word of mouth around Poland, uh, well, Poles are rather philosophical about problems that come their direction from the east. They're not surprised by them. All right, David Ensor, many thanks. Later in this broadcast, we'll be talking with Senator Alphonse D'Amato of New York, who insists that the Soviets have an obligation to share whatever they know about this accident. And we'll talk with Soviet expert Marshall Goldman about what the Russians aren't saying and why. But when we come back, why it's so dangerous. We'll be joined by a leading French expert on nuclear reactors, Shoja Etemad, and by ABC News medical editor, Dr. Timothy Johnson. There are 100 nuclear reactors in the United States supplying 16% of the nation's electricity and one half of the U.S. population lives within 100 miles of a nuclear power plant. Regionally, the New England states are the most dependent on nuclear power for their electricity, followed by the southeastern and middle Atlantic states. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Kraft. It sure is in our macaroni and cheese. Presenting Velveeta Shells and Cheese Dinners. Why did Mommy switch? Velveeta Shells and Cheese Dinners taste creamier because we start with creamy Velveeta cheese sauce, not a powder. We liked our old macaroni and cheese. With pasta shells that hold on to that creamy Velveeta. This tastes creamier than our old macaroni and cheese. I hope you learned your lesson. Velveeta Shells and Cheese Dinners taste creamier than the rest because it's Velveeta. How do we know Ford is producing the highest quality cars and trucks designed and built in America? Because the nationwide survey tells us so. The survey covered owner-reported problems in areas like engines, electrical systems, brakes, starting and steering. And as a group, Lincoln's, Mercury's and Ford cars and trucks were found to be the highest quality cars and trucks designed and built in America. That's what happens when you make quality job one. Quality is job one. We're way overstocked here at the Jim Reed Auto and Truck Discount Center. Over 1,000 cars and trucks clearly marked with the retail price and the Jim Reed discount price. Import buyers, we're closing out 93 Subarus and Isuzu's cars and trucks. And you save three big ways. Get the Jim Reed discount plus closeout price plus beat the coming price increase to save nearly 5% more during our $9 million inventory reduction sale through April 30th at the Jim Reed Auto and Truck Discount Center. Exit 209A, downtown. 
Wouldn't you like to save 50% on your clothing and look like a million? You can with fine men's clothing from Berry Manufacturing because we sell factory direct to you. From elegant formal attire to contemporary casual wear, Barry's got your size from 35 short to 60 extra long. At Barry, you'll save 50% on sport coats, suits, slacks, tuxedos, shirts, and shorts. So don't pay high retail prices for real quality. Shop Barry Manufacturing where factory direct prices and fine clothing have been our trademark for 85 years. nuclear disaster in the Soviet Union. Fire still burning out of control. The danger may actually be increasing. Tomorrow, watch ABC's World News Tonight. A Soviet diplomat in Finland today called it the worst nuclear accident in history. Have the potential dangers been overstated? Joining us live now in our Paris bureau is Shorja Etemad, a nuclear safety consultant and nuclear reactor designer. And in our Boston Bureau, ABC News medical editor, Dr. Timothy Johnson. Mr. Etemad, in very simple language, so that I can understand it, if you would, please explain to me the significance of this graphite core that is supposedly burning in the middle of the reactor. Uh, I, 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 I don't quite understand. What do you mean by the significance? Well, uh, I mean, why dangers? is... Well, yes, what is the danger what, of that? What, why, 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 why is it burning? Uh, this, this is... Uh, something which is quite unforgivable forgivable is the fact that we've had the same accident uh, about 30 years ago and we haven't learned any lessons from it considering every considering that everything was uh, kept very secret in fact it's a habit within the nuclear industry to keep everything secret since we consider that secrecy is part of the protection that we provide for the reactor. All right, but let me interrupt you because what I really need to know is why is that so dangerous to the population in the area? The fact that there is a fire that is still burning. Two questions. One, why is it so difficult to put that fire out? And two, what is the danger of that fire? First of all, the fire that we had in about 30 years ago in, in England, we managed to put it out finally when nothing was working with the fireman's hoose. Uh, which we just went in and poured water on it. Uh, in this case, we just can't do it because it's not a small uh, research reactor. It's a huge monstrosity of uh, uh, graphite, which would be impossible to just get any close to. It's, it's lethally radioactive, the environment. We have to manage to establish cooling channels within the reactor in order to cool it up or just let it burn and uh, to burn itself out. Now, by burning, what is the danger of that? Is the fire itself carrying the radioactivity into the surrounding area? Not only, you see, the, the graphite itself is used as a moderator. Moderator, that is to say, it uh, controls the, chain re the nuclear chain reaction. We slow down the uh, neutrons so that we can have a better uh, 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 thermal uh, uh, efficiency. The, the moderator, the graphite, when it gets hot and it goes, uh, you know, or it's burning, it will become more and more effective and uh, in, uh, increasing the chain reaction. So as a result, we don't know. The fact that the graphite is going higher in temperature is making the uranium burn faster, more, or less. So, we just don't know. So in effect, then, we are getting more radiation the longer that fire continues. Is that an accurate statement? Uh, it is a, a quite a possibility. Unfortunately, nobody at this stage knows, but it is a strong, there's a strong possibility that the graphite is going to make, uh, while burning, is going to make the uranium burn faster, and it's going to get hotter and hotter. All right, let me switch now to Tim Johnson in Boston. Dr. Johnson. There are supposedly some 50,000 people in close proximity to this nuclear reactor. Radiation is being spread. Unfortunately, we, we cannot say at this point at what level. But what does radiation do to people who are within uh, a mile or so of a nuclear reactor? Well, distance counts for something, but the ultimate criteria of damage is the amount of radiation received by the body and how fast, how intensively that is received. Assuming worst case scenarios that they are receiving rads in the range of 500 to 1,000, uh, this is the kind of exposure that can result literally in death within hours from what is called the cerebral or brain syndrome. These people have brain damage, they become confused, they have convulsions, they wander around. These are the pictures we tend to remember from these kinds of exposures or that have been dram 
dr uh, made dramatic on television presentations, and this can result in death within hours or days. Uh, at lesser levels, but of still intense exposure, people can have further damage to other parts of the body, including the intestines, the blood-forming system, and they will die within days or weeks. So, depending on the amount of radiation received by a given person at whatever distance, they literally can die within hours or days or weeks. Now, as the distance is further away from the reactor, as the level of radiation is lower, is it possible that death can then be put off by months or even years, that people get long-term damage, which we won't even begin to see for quite some time to come? You've put it very precisely, and to me, in some ways, that's almost the more frightening aspect of this kind of accident. There can be damage that will not result in symptoms or in signs for months or years, or in the case of certain cancers, thyroid cancers, possibly leukemias, for decades. So people who have been exposed, even to low levels, are really not going to be scot-free for the rest of their life. Now, Tim, last night we, we pointed out that this particular reactor is right next to what may well be a major water supply for the city of Kiev, a city of more than two million people. A, what is this going to do to the water supply? B, what does it do to the food chain? What does it do to grass, to, to cattle that may be eating the grass, and so on? And what is the long-term effect of that? The potential of this radioactive cloud and continuing radiation to contaminate both water and food supply is enormous. Again, unfortunately, we won't have answers for years and decades in some cases to just how great that contamination was, how widespread in the water and food supply it might be, and what its effects are. But that's part of the frightening aspect. It will take decades to know the answers to the questions you ask in this moment of time. All right, Tim Johnson and Shoshaya Timad, if you'd be good enough to stand by, please. When we come back, we'll have a report on the human costs of previous nuclear accidents throughout the world. On May 25th, millions of Americans will join hands to fight hunger and homelessness in their own country. We at Citibank are proud to help fund this important event. And you can help fund it every time you use a Citibank Visa or MasterCard. Reach out and touch. Reach out. Take a close look at the car that was the world's best-selling car in 1982, in 1983, 1984, and 1985. You probably know what it is. It's Ford Escort. Ford Escort, world's best-selling car, four years running. Get 7.9% financing on new Ford Escort at your participating Ford dealer now. Number in the Y107 Tennessee Lottery is 9075107. That's my number. 10 minutes to call me at Y107 if that's your number. Have your Tennessee Lottery ticket handy. When you hear your number, call the new Y107 within 10 minutes to win your share of thousands of dollars. Hey, I've won. Let me use the phone. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't let this please, happen please, to you. Know where your tickets are and be listening for the Tennessee Lottery winning numbers only from Y107 yeah. and during Channel 2 News at 10. Come on in for our chicken fillet sandwich, now only $1.49. Dairy Queen makes it with a juicy, tender breast fillet. All white meat. Nothing but the best. Seasoned just right and cooked up moist and flavorful. Try our chicken fillet sandwich. Mmm, now only $1.49. Only at Dairy Queen. We treat you right. Hello, I'm Nanette Fabre. Closed captioned. Have you ever wondered exactly what that term means? Well, closed captions are subtitles, just like the ones you see here. The captions appear when a decoder is connected with any TV set. Closed captions let you enjoy TV, even with no sound. Oh, it's a tremendous boon for the hearing impaired. For more information, call this toll-free number, 1-800-528-6600. Thank you. You heard earlier on in this broadcast that secretiveness is a common characteristic to the nuclear industry on both sides of the Iron Curtain. Accidents at nuclear reactor plants have been with us, in fact, since the 1950s. And this is not the first one where the cost can be measured in human lives. Here's Nightline correspondent James Walker. Twenty-six countries in the world use nuclear reactors to supply part of their electrical needs. 
in the last 29 years, there have been 15 major accidents. Ironically, the first nuclear accident was similar to the latest disaster in Chernobyl, October 7, 1957, north of Liverpool, England, in a town called Windscale, the home of British nuclear fuels. Windscale's plutonium weapons reactor suddenly caught fire, releasing iodine and other radioactive elements into the atmosphere, contaminating a 200-square-mile area. The trouble arose when radioactive dust from the overheated pile fell on the Cumberland pastures, and milk samples rushed to Harwell were found to contain six times as much radioactive iodine as international health standards permit. So for the time being, down the drain it goes. At the time of the incident, officials claimed there would be no health problems. But in 1983, 25 years later, the British government said the radiation released was probably the cause of 39 cancer deaths, genetic damage, and 240 cases of thyroid cancer, among them Alex Bryson. Alex was 10 years old in 1957. On the day the power plant caught fire, she was one mile downwind at this school. I went through quite a lot of... Um trauma and um, you know it took quite a long time to get back to normal again and as I say I've got this very big scar I have to take um, tablets daily which I couldn't live without two months later the Soviet Union suffered its first serious nuclear accident when the atomic waste depot exploded in the city of Kishtim 800 miles east of Moscow journalist Andrew Coburn has investigated the incident there was emergency evacuations uh, there were scenes of panic in the towns and villages in the, in the path of the dust cloud. For years afterwards, the effects could still be discerned. For instance, women who got pregnant living in that anywhere near, uh, we usually were officially required to undergo abortions. Uh, all fresh food that was grown in the area had to be checked with a Geiger counter. Soviet authorities tried to cover up the accident, but exile scientist Zoriz Medvedev says the damage was so widespread that 33 villages had to be destroyed. It was necessary to destroy villages in order to prevent people from returning back for their possession, for their things. So it was deliberate uh, destruction by officials rather than by, by, the, by the explosion as such. Eight of the 15 major nuclear accidents have occurred in the United States. 1961, Idaho Falls, Idaho. An experimental reactor goes out of control, killing three technicians. 1966, Detroit, Michigan. The core of an experimental breeder reactor partially melts, but safety equipment averts a disaster. 1975, Decatur, Alabama. One worker with a candle sets off a $100 million reactor fire, lowering the cooling water to dangerous levels. But the accident that almost ended in disaster occurred in 1979 at Three Mile Island outside Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. This is news from WKBO. Metropolitan Edison Company officials had to shut down their Three Mile Island nuclear power stations unit number two this morning after an accident occurred within the plant's turbine system that resulted in the release of radioactivity into the atmosphere. There was a partial meltdown. Some uranium melted. Today, seven years later, no one knows exactly how much radiation was released over the countryside. It was raining. The wind was blowing quite strongly. When I went out on the porch, the wind stopped, just stopped. And all of a sudden, there was a wave of heat just rolled over me. It was three, four weeks later that I noticed my hair coming out, and it was getting gray. It was white, I should say, white all through it. We saw a 10% increase in sterility in our cows. We experienced stillbirths, abortions in the cows, in the goats, a uh, decrease in production for the ducks that we had here at the time. We had severe retardation in the cats, unable to walk, unable to develop abortions in the cats. But scientists believe that Saturday's disastrous meltdown at Chernobyl was more serious because unlike Three Mile Island, there was no containment building surrounding the reactor core. At Three Mile Island, there was a partial melting of the reactor core, but the reactor vessel remained intact, and the containment structure contained most of the radiation which was released. Whereas here in the Soviet Union, it seems almost certain that there's been a, a rather large <clears throat> melting of the reactor core. It should be noted that there are eight reactors operating in the United States that do not have containment structures. Officials, however, at the Department of Energy 
say that safety in these cases is not a problem because the reactors operate at lower pressures and at lower temperatures, making containment buildings unnecessary. But it's also worth noting that one of the problems that people around the world are learning about is that officials always maintain that everything is all right. All right, that is, until something goes wrong. This is James Walker for Nightline. When we come back, the impact of the Soviet nuclear disaster in Washington and in the Kremlin. We'll talk with Senator Alphonse D'Amato, who today urged President Reagan to seek international inspection of Soviet nuclear plants. And we'll be talking with Soviet affairs expert, Professor Marshall Goldman. Miss Jones! Oh, uh, no, Miss Jones, 25 in red. Because work is tough enough, there's Canon's NP3525 dual color copier. It lets you change colors. Oh, oh, uh, not the grapes in red, just the apples. And it's the only copier that copies in two colors at the same time, with just a touch. Oh, forget the grapes, just give me more apples. <laughs> Canon's dual color copier, with a singular difference. For information, call toll-free 1-800-OK-CANON. -OK there's a special kind of Cadillac, the new 1986 Seville, the ultimate Cadillac. Very new, very sophisticated, with road manners to match. You could call the 1986 Seville the new essence of elegance. Best of all, it's a Cadillac. I spent three months a year living out of a suitcase, so I always stay at a quality or comfort inn. They give me the same room and service as the other big lodging chains, but for less money. I just call toll-free to make reservations for all my business trips and even family vacations. Daddy, are you there yet? <laughs> just dial 800-228-5151 or call your travel agent and see how affordable quality lodging can be. Think I was born yesterday. Kraft Light Reduced Calorie Mayonnaise tastes so good, some people just won't believe it's got half the calories of regular mayonnaise. Sure. Now sell me the Brooklyn Bridge. Less than half the calories and half the fat of Hellman's Real Mayonnaise. No way, Jose. Kraft Light is just so rich and creamy and tastes so good. Half the calories. <laughs> Kraft Light. You'll never believe it has half the calories. It tastes too good. Shh. The Soviet nuclear disaster. Fire still burns out of control, and danger may be increasing. Tomorrow on ABC's World News This Morning. Before Good Morning America. What can be done about the illiteracy problem in America? We'll find out tomorrow. Also meet the Playmate of the Year, and Tom Cruise tells about his new movie tomorrow on Good Morning America. Joining us live now in our Washington bureau is Senator Alphonse D'Amato of New York, who was briefed today by the Reagan administration on the Soviet nuclear disaster, and Marshall Goldman, Associate Director of the Russian Research Center at Harvard University. Senator D'Amato, are the officials telling us more than they know? Ted, I don't think they're giving us all the information. Uh, we've received some reports that the casualties uh, might be up to 2,000 and certainly go beyond, as uh, the good doctor had indicated, the radiation uh, the real damage is uh, yet to be assessed. Uh, the fact of the matter is, though, uh, that really the, the Soviets were terribly uh, derelict. I think their conduct was reprehensible in not reporting to the world, as well as to their own people, uh, the dimensions of this disaster. And I think they're going to continue to unfold uh, in spite of their reluctance to, uh, uh, to come up with the facts. Let me just interrupt for one second to warn our affiliates that we're going to be going a little bit over tonight. I hope you'll forgive us, but as you know, we had some late information from Bali where the White House was briefing reporters, and we had Sam Donaldson at the top of this broadcast something which we did not have, so we're going to continue just a little bit beyond our normally allotted midnight hour. Senator D'Amato, I guess what I have to ask you is this. We have heard through the course of this program, for some reason the nuclear industry globally seems to be a particularly secretive industry, and I can understand they don't want to unnecessarily alarm the citizenry of the Soviet Union, of Great Britain, of this country, so we're always getting reassuring words not only from Russian officials, but from British officials and American officials. What you're asking, is it realistic? Yes, I am uh, asking something that's very realistic, and I think it's time has come. Uh, I've written to the president, and tomorrow we'll be sponsoring a resolution along with uh, Senator Nichols, 
that uh, calls for the International Atomic Energy Agency to monitor these plants throughout the world, including the Soviet Union and the United States. They now do it uh, under the office, uh, offices of the, uh, the UN, uh, under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. They monitor 120 plus countries. As a matter of fact, they were in the process of getting agreements from the Soviet Union to monitor this installation. Uh, true, it was for a different matter, not for safety, but when we uh, look at the fact that the Soviet Union will be uh, building and operating up to 61 of these plants and only 10 of them have containment buildings and that we really are placing not only their citizens but the citizens of the world at risk, the, the time for uh, action really is now and I think this demonstrates you know a nuclear accident is is not one that stops at the boundaries nuclear proliferation doesn't stop at national boundaries it's an international problem all right professor goldman you're a sovietologist here tonight is there a snowball's chance in hell that the soviet union is going to allow an international monitoring team in to take a look at what's at what's happened either at that plant or any of their other reactors well it's hard to know exactly obviously ted but i think that there is a good chance simply because world pressure in Eastern Europe, Western Europe, the rest of the world, and including their own people, I think is going to mount. My own sense is that there must be enormous anxiety now inside the Soviet Union. Uh, the, the sparse words that are getting out officially from the Soviet government only serve to fan the, the concern and the fury uh, what they're doing to their own people. And it'll be very interesting to see what happens on Thursday, which is May Day, and a big celebration where the leaders have to expose themselves to the international press uh, and other, other leaders. And I have a sense that this is going to come to a head. I don't see that. I don't think that they can go back and conduct business as usual. I just don't. This is too significant a, a phenomenon. Now, Professor Goldman, uh, what any good Sovietologist has to learn, and you're one of the best, is how to read between the lines of those official statements. What are you seeing between the lines of what they are saying publicly? And they've actually said a surprising amount. They have said a surprising amount, and and I think what's happening is they're beginning to realize that they've made a, dis a disastrous public relations uh, a, a relation mistake here and that uh, they need help, they have to recognize that, and indeed if they don't get help, the situation is, is going to become worse. All right, I want to go back to Paris for a moment, to Mr. Etemad. Uh, you had yes. some points you, you, you wanted to make. Please go exactly. ahead and make it. First, uh, and when I talk about being secretive, it's not only secretive, you know, there's, there's not, we don't keep, keep the secrets only amongst ourselves. We keep the secret, the short, technical shortcomings secret from the... I'm afraid we've just lost audio to our, to our Paris remote, so Mr. Etemad, I hope you'll forgive us, and let me go back then to, uh, to Senator D'Amato. The question becomes, how much are we capable of knowing independently? I mean, this is verification, uh, national means of verification in a manner that I guess we had not expected to use. Some of us are under the impression that our satellites and our capacity of, of intercepting radio broadcasts and so on tells us almost everything we need to know. Do we, in fact, know everything we need to know? Well, no, Ted, we really don't. Uh, the dimensions of actually the uh, loss of life, for example, and the physical injuries sustained is uh, still somewhat up in the air. We get that through other sources, uh, not from spy satellites. Of course, we do know that there was a very real explosion, a tremendous one at that site. Um, but we are still dependent upon intelligence information and information we get from allies. And, and uh, that kind of information is just really beginning to sift through. And we, we really do know, although uh, the CIA has not given us a confirmation of the magnitude uh, as it relates to the number of casualties. And there we're getting conflicting reports, but uh, obviously even the Soviet Union is beginning to up its estimates. They now say that somewhere under 100 people uh, may have died. Uh, we get information that that figure may well go go into uh, 2,000 plus. All right, Marshall Goldman, we've, we've almost got to wrap up, but I'd like you to do one more piece of interpretation for us. When you hear the Poles taking the kinds of measures that they are taking, that almost has to be with Soviet concurrence, does it not? And what does that mean? Well, not necessarily. I, I think that the East European countries are sincerely frightened by what's happening because they're downwind of what's going on. But it may very well be the Soviets have no uh, choice in this matter. 
Uh, I think the polls are doing it independently, but I, what I think is that the, the rumors that are beginning to develop and are going to cross the border through Voice of America, through BBC, are going to cause enormous concern in the Soviet Union. They read between the lines better than any of us can do, and they must know what's happening and must be very concerned. All right, gentlemen, I thank all of you very much. Monsieur Etemad in Paris, Tim Johnson in Boston, and Senator D'Amato and Marshall Goldman. Thank you all. There's a lot more to be said, but I'm afraid we just don't have the time to stay on any longer. Stay with ABC News for the latest on the Soviet nuclear accident and its after effects on World News this morning and Good Morning America. And of course, we'll have a full report on World News tonight with Peter Jennings tomorrow evening. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night.